All right. So Patricia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction to everything, Sarah, and for organizing this um, series. I have the honor to introduce the first speaker in this session. Um, Dr. Maggie Hellstrom has a background in experimental nuclear chemistry and nuclear physics with a, a Master of Science from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, which she earned in 1988, and a PhD from Uppsala uh, University, which she um, got four years later. She has uh, served at several nuclear physics institutes in the US, Germany, and Sweden, and holds an associate professorship in physics at Lund University. Since 2010, Maggie works at the Department of Physical Geography and Ecosystem Science in Lund, where she has been involved in various greenhouse gas and environmental science projects, and also teaches basic data management. In 2015, she joined the ICOS Carbon Portal team, working with research data management questions, including FAIR and open science, and representing ICOS in several European research projects. And she will tell us a little bit more about that now and how that relates to persistent identifiers. Maggie, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Patricia. Let me see if I can share my screen here so you can see my presentation. Yes, does it work? Do you see it? Perfect. Thank Great. you. Great. Lovely. Um, so um, I thought I would be a little bit uh, quite general and, and uh, introducing in my, my presentation and not really dive into any uh, technical details or anything. And I should also say that uh, I, I'm happy to present today from an earth and environmental science perspective a little bit. Um, so, so that's where I'm coming from now since uh, the last 10 years or something like that. So, uh, oops. So um, just first a, a slide about why, why I think that identifiers are so important uh, and especially those that are often referred to as GERPIs or GERPIDs because people love these weird acronyms, don't we? So, um, so they are globally unique, they are resolvable and they are persistent. And a colleague of mine commented on this slide that I should have said universally um, unique because of course now humans are not just working on earth but we are moving into the universe and space as well. So uh, we should not uh, confuse our identifiers uh, if we're working on earth or on Mars or or something else. So what these do is, is they don't only provide a, a, an unambiguous identity mechanism so that we can really say that when I use this identifier, I mean this particular object or resource or asset or whatever. But um, importantly, uh, this is tied to being able to register um, the identifiers in, in globally resolvable um, registries that are, are um, so if you have a, an identifier you should be able to put it into a sort of search and lookup mechanism you should be able to retrieve from there at least the location on the web uh, or in the internet where you can find uh, either the, doc, the the item itself like a bit stream or at least the metadata record of it which will help you further to understand where to get it what it is what it contains and, and everything around it. And it, it, this started out with uh, this information being accessible to humans to help researchers and others. But of course, now we are moving more and more into a world where machine driven processes are acting on everything, not only in research, but um, through throughout all of society. So it is very important that we, we move to, to a a situation where all this information can be read, understood and acted upon also by, by scripts and, and machine driven processes. So identifiers, yes, they are. Uh, they, they should provide a means for accurate citation. If you are, have used it, you should be able to cite it, uh, say in, in a publication record or something like that. Uh, this, of course, incidentally also allows you to enable extraction of, of uh, usage statistics uh, for, for any identified object. Uh, but you should also be able to reference it in a workflow and in a provenance record, etc. We should remember that it's 
not just data that should have identifiers, we should identify any object that has a digital representation or we should be able to. And we should be doing this not just uh, at the very last step of our research um, activities, but throughout the whole research data life cycle as it is uh, applicable, convenient. Uh, we should assign uh, identifiers um, when we create something new, and we should remember to use identifiers for other objects that other people have created or, or set up. And this can help us uh, to really have a comprehensive documentation of everything that we're doing. And this is a, a part of normal ethical science to do that, a proper way of working in, in science. So we can have openness, transparency, and this of course gives people trust in, in what we are doing. And it's also become reproducible for others to, to really go back and see what we've been doing. So we should be uh, using digital identifiers throughout the whole life cycle. Uh, so I come from the environmental and earth science community. And, and in Europe, we have something that we call the ENVRI community, which is a, a kind of loose, uh, collaboration between uh, a large number of organizations and research infrastructures that are involved in these fields of say atmospheric ecosystem and biodiversity, solid earth and also marine science. And uh, although we are very, very diverse in, in all different kinds of aspects, uh, we have one thing in common and that is that we measure and observe things in the natural environment in real time as it happens. So that means that we cannot go back and repeat our observations if we have lost our data or we didn't document it or we didn't uh, really do, do the process correctly. So we, we really have to pay very, very much attention to getting all of this right from the beginning. And here's uh, just one aspect of this is then, of course, our use of identifiers. Uh, so this really helps us if we assign these unique, persistent and resolvable uh, identifiers to all our assets, not just the data, but also um, the metadata, our instrumentation, our measurement stations, etc. And we use uh, existing identifiers for our people, our organizations, our grants and all of these things. And we make sure to, to be have a good strategy and comprehensive start strategy for doing this in a controlled way. This really, really helps um, not only ourselves to understand and share information and share data between uh, inside of the, our subdomains, but also in between subdomains in, in our own uh, community, but also beyond it. So we can get this rich metadata that is required to be fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So, um, but we're not, of course, living in our own isolated world. Um, we need to collaborate, not only with other scientists in, around the world that are doing research in the same, uh, domains as we do, but also beyond. Uh, so collaborations and being open to collaborations is extremely important for us uh, because we uh, want to share our experiences and our knowledge with others, but we also want to be able to pick the brains of uh, experts throughout the, the whole uh, world on, on all kinds of research data management related issues. And of course, also about our research itself. So. Having this possibility to work together with others to identify common issues and, and questions, uh, bringing together under some kind of organizational umbrella experts and non-experts, people who are interested across research disciplines and professions. And I say this, that this, I want to stress professions here because we do not only want to have researchers here, we want IT experts, we want librarians, we want uh, data and information scientists and, and the data stewards and, and whatever competence is needed to, to work together and, and make advances in order to formulate best practices, suggest new standards and things like that. And one extremely important 
uh, such organization uh, also for me personally has been the Research Data Alliance, uh, which I've been a member of since uh, I think 2015 or something like that. So not quite from the beginning, but almost. And uh, I've been very lucky and fortunate to take part in many groups there, uh, not the least working on things that are related to, to FAIR and identifiers and uh, also to education and, and other aspects of, of research data management. And if you're not a member of the RDA already, I really recommend you to, to uh, become one because it's for free uh, and you get uh, really access to a fantastic, warm and very welcome and very, very um, competent uh, uh, collaboration of people. And you can uh, be a passive member, a lurk there, or you can really dive in and contribute to the work in the different groups. Uh, not the least, uh, the uh, interest group on uh, FAIR Digital Object uh, Fabric, which I'm a co-chair um, uh, of since uh, a few months. So welcome to that. Uh, and beyond the RDA, there are, of course, all these other organizations. And just to mention a few, uh, we have the European Open Science Cloud itself and, and the many projects that are associated with that, not the least the USC Future. Uh, we have Force 11, which is an interesting uh, organization working a lot with, say, from starting from a library point of view, but also expanding beyond there. We have CoData and uh, the Fair Digital Object Forum. So with that, uh, that's it sort of for me today, this short presentation. I'm just really looking forward to uh, engaging with you now today and also afterwards at any point, you're always welcome to contact me at my email address. Thank you very much. Um, Maggie, thank you so much. That was great. Um, I want to remind you, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the um, the notes, and we'll have the question and answer session later. Um, next up, we have Natasha Simmons introducing Peter Wittenberg. All right, I'm here. Just give me a second. I will get Peter's bio. So it is my pleasure to welcome Peter Wittenberg to the stage of this virtual webinar. So Peter is the head of the language archive that was built as a collaboration between the Max Planck Society, the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. He is senior data systems advisor at the Max Planck Compute and Data Facility founding and organizing the FAIR Digital Object Forum, which I'm sure we'll hear quite a lot more about today. From 2017 to 2018, he was founding director of the Research Data Alliance Deutschland EV. From 2012 to 2016, he was member of the Technical Advisory Board of the RDA. And from 2015 to 2018, he was executive director of the RDA Europe Project. Handing to you, Peter. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen. And as you may guess, I did a lot together with Maggie. So uh, we share a lot of uh, same opinions of it. And uh, what I want to tell you is Uh, Peter, you're muted, and the screen share is just off. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yes. There I, we go. <laughs> I, well, I had this problem earlier, so I will keep it like this here. Um, I don't know why that is. So I hope you can see the slides. So very, very simple slides. So I, I think there is a problem with my Zoom implement, implementation. So I have to, to do something on it. So I hope you can see this, the, the, the content of the slide and will not uh, go to full screen mode. There's something wrong. So um, sorry for that. So my focus will be on the trust issues uh, related with PIDs. So as Maggie said, when I talk about PIDs, I 
also mean exactly these groupies. Uh, uh, so that's very clear. And I come from data science in the Max Planck Society Institute. And if you, we, if I guess we may say, as Mackey also introduced modern science about reusing data from different labs. Let me put it very simple here. And I just showed uh, at the left side two examples. So the uh, millions of data points aggregated from many material science labs worldwide and distributed in a distributed fashion. And where I was advisor and uh, millions of data points about many languages in the world. Uh, which I was responsible for, which is also a very highly distributed uh, uh, scenario with lots of data uh, which you want to share. So you need to build on trust. And the trust has many different aspects, just to mention a few. Is it the right one? So is it the right piece of data which you want to have, which you got uh, an, uh, a reference to? Is it authorized? Is it really the stuff which has been created by the, by the creators? Is it authentic? Uh, is it maintained? Well, does the context fit and so forth? So there are many questions which you would like to ask. So and it's all about trust. And what I claim is that PIDs are at the base of the trust pyramid, which I will try to show. Well, here's another just uh, example just to, to mention it since it's a uh, hype, currently deep learning. Probably we all our labs do it, scientific labs do it, the industry does it. And if you want to correlate, for example, some phenomena in in our case, it was, was brain disease. Uh, you have uh, to uh, fill a lot, uh, to, to uh, 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 calculate a lot of parameters, and you need a lot of data if you want to correlate between some phenomena and data which you are measuring. And there's no one institute currently uh, that has all the data if you want to do this kind of correlation in, with respect to brain uh, diseases or brain uh, problems. So you are dependent on other researchers, other labs. Sometimes you even don't know them personally and you need to trust their data, uh, the data which they generated in their specific circumstances. Well, here's, a, here's how one could uh, 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 implement trust. Dona is just one example. And in a moment we will hear Matt who is uh, hiding around uh, behind data site and uh, the International DOI Foundation. So it's just one example, there may be others. So Dona is a, um, is a uh, independent Swiss foundation. It had to be in Switzerland since it's global. If you could see the, the faces here, they come from all uh, uh, kind of regions and, and continents in the world. So it had to be in Switzerland since Switzerland is the only uh, accepted place obviously, which is neutral enough for the Chinese, Russians, uh, uh, Africans and so forth. So it has a, uh, a board of directors and these board of directors, it's also international, that takes care that this root resolving node uh, system is functioning and that there are contracts, as we so see here, is that there are contracts between, for example, a, uh, the, one of the root providers with a certain pro uh, service provider in, uh, in this case uh, uh, hosted in Germany. And uh, Matt will uh, explain you how the International DOI Foundation is using. And as you may know, the DOIs are handles. They have a suffix and prefix. And the suffix is a, a bit special, but Matt will tell us more about this. And the prefix, they have special, um, special. Uh, so DOI has special arrangements for how to, uh, to uh, create the prefix. If you create your own resolver, as for example, the climate community did, or the Slovenian national computer system did, you can create your own rules how to create uh, prefixes. You need to buy, a, you get a license. It's all about contracts. It's all about uh, responsibility and accountability. And uh, you can set up a service uh, under certain uh, schemes of, uh, of contracts. And uh, if it's necessary, you can thus provide your own resolver by a small machine and it does the, its job. So it's an international board running under the umbrella of the ITU, which is a huge ins, uh, base. And that may give uh, some trust in the existence of this service. And as you know, trust is not a technical issue, it's a social issue. Um, I think it's clear that all these, this machinery works based on clear contracts. And I think that's the main issue I want to uh, 
to bring uh, to bring over. So what is the relation to fair digital objects now? Fair digital objects are based on a machinery that is very much dependent on PIDs and information, structural information, which you relate with a PID. And that's why we talk about resolution of PIDs. When you resolve a PID, you should get this uh, structured information um, and there are different approaches. I will not go into detail here. So this is the approach which some of us use when they uh, use handles or DOIs. Uh, you have attributes um, which uh, can uh, link to metadata, for example. You have attributes which link to copies of data. You can have, you can have attributes which uh, link to rights records and so forth. And of course, you could include uh, 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 attributes like checksum or so to prove authenticity. The important point for DOIs is now, for uh, fair digital objects is now, that whatever you do, all these specifications which you are seeing here about the attributes, about the profiles so or the set of attributes, that has to be machine actionable. You know that the, the FAIR principles are a piece of paper. They are not uh, meant uh, or not directly uh, allow you to, uh, to, uh, to implement an infrastructure. So FAIR digital objects are one way to implement the FAIR uh, principles. It's just that there are other suggestions maybe. So, PIDs result to trustworthy information, and that's the most important point for the FDOs, and therefore the PIDs must be persistent, and therefore then we need to have well-maintained services as shown in the slide uh, uh, before. And here I hope that you understand why PIDs are at the basis of the FDO trust pyramid. So summarizing the uh, about uh, requirements about PID systems, they should be identities and not locations, since location will change. Be careful with semantics and the suffix that might confuse after a while. We need highly secure mechanisms. That means if I create a PID somewhere, I need to make uh, to be sure that no one else except myself is allowed to change the PID record, since otherwise, and so this has to be highly secure, the best security mechanism we can invent at this moment. Uh, so if some if if uh, if someone else would change my PID record, then we would have a big problem. And of course, the the machinery has to be redundant, uh, which you could see from the donor slide. There's a lot of redundancy in there. It has all to be machine actionable. That means if a machine finds a PID and resolve it to an a set of attributes, the P machine must understand what these attributes mean. And of course, if you uh, we should have a unified PID access protocol. These the services are distributed, but as I said, the providers need to be reliable, uh, uh, have to be a responsible uh, attitude, uh, have to be accountable and persistent. And that's the end of my story. This is, how I, <laughs> this is why I became a trapper over the years. So trust, responsibility, accountability, and persistence. I think these are so crucial for our data infrastructures, uh, which are global, as you can see. So thanks for the attention. And if you don't, if you are not afraid about trappers, join the FDO forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I think I am handing to Nabil to introduce Matt. Yes, you are. Sure. <laughs> Sure. So I'm very happy to, to introduce Matthew Pais. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go for the introduction. So Matthew leads a passionate and committed team at DataSite, who provides the means to create, find, cite, connect, and use research globally. Uh, based in Amsterdam, Matthew focuses on building DataSite into a sustainable global community. Previously, Matt was the director of engagement at ORCID, where he played an important role in growing the community into an international scale research effort. He was also my manager at ORCID. And prior to ORCID, Matthew was uh, based in, in Johannesburg and has, has worked at uh, both Thomson Reuters and UPSCO Information Services. And Matt, the, the floor is yours. OK, 
Great, thanks. Just checking, you can see my screen and hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Great, thanks, Nabil, for the introduction. And um, great to follow on from Maggie and Peter. It's always great to present alongside you both. So um, I will jump right in. Um, not going to go into too many sort of technical details, but really sort of focus on uh, some of the fundamentals that we believe in at DataSight and how we work with the community to really um, focus around common objectives and our mission as, as a community. Um, so I always like to start with a bit of context that DataSight is first and foremost a global community. We are a community that share a common interest and really, this is about ensuring that research outputs and resources, so resources are important. Um, it's not just the research outputs, and Maggie touched on this, but that these are openly available, that they're connected, and that these can be reused to advance knowledge across and between disciplines, both now and in the future. We also seek to make research, the, the process of research, more effective by connecting these different things together. And we enable the creation and management of this through the use of persistent identifiers, um, enhancing research workflows um, through various service integrations with different systems and, and workflows, and then facilitating the discovery and reuse of these research outputs and resources through different uh, tools and global community infrastructure. As a community, um, we are uh, spread across 50 countries globally. Um, and we continue to grow um, as, as a community um, that share this common interest and work together in really building sustainable infrastructure. And this is really, really critical. And um, when we talk about infrastructure, um, you know, I, I always use this as, as an analogy that we need to make sure that infrastructure is working, that it doesn't have pain points, that we don't always if we're talking about things, it means that things aren't working smoothly for us in the infrastructure. And when we think about sustainable infrastructure, it's important that we're not just thinking about a technical solution, but also really important pieces like governance. What are the services that we build onto the infrastructure as a community? What is the insurance that we give as an example? Are we making sure that the data is not for sale as an, as an example, making sure that it's CC zero, making sure that the code base is MIT open source, that we have the insurance in place that as we as a global community invest time and effort as well as money into the infrastructure, that the, there is that critical insurance in place for the community. And then that we have a model and a reliable model that will ensure the long-term sustainability, again, linking back to the investment by the community. If this is on soft funding, um, it's really difficult to ensure that we have the long-term sustainability and everything we, we talk about, PIDs, it's persistent identifiers. And that means that it has to be sustainable. Anything that isn't sustainable is really, um, I guess, falling short of our mission around persistent identifiers and the use of persistent identifiers in workflows. So that's really important. The other piece of what we try to do is affect community change. And so we often talk about ourselves as, uh, I, I guess, a community of communities and a community of practice um, working together. Um, as infrastructure, as, as a community driving infrastructure, we see our fundamental role, um, our, our core role, as being the infrastructure and building the experience, making sure that the experience is smooth and useful to researchers globally. And in this, we're looking to make it possible to do some of these things, to address these use cases, but also make it easy so that it's streamlined, that it doesn't create challenges for people. On the top end, we can work with policymakers to make things required. We can uh, then look to you know, make sure that it's rewarding. And then as a community, we actually see that it starts to become normative. But I'm a big, um, I guess, proponent or, or fan of saying that we need to make sure that the fundamentals are there, that it is possible and that it is easy before we walk around as a community with big sticks and say it has to be required. Um, as an example. So really important that we think about it in this context and that we're thinking about how, how we work together on this. Um, scaling PID communities and identify communities, and I wouldn't actually maybe 
define communities as, as a PID community, but really working with different groups that use persistent identifiers is what I'm getting at here. And this is something that at Datasite we've done for many years. We've um, worked across a range of communities with a common interest, looking to scale and support different initiatives. We have over 28 different um, resource types um, supported in our schema. Um, these range from samples through to data sets, through to data management plans. Um, and as we've seen, um, the growth in adoption across the community, we've seen um, broader use of our services and community stakeholders, which is really important for us as a community to really be inclusive and, and truly represent the global community. But in doing this, we need to make sure that we're partnering and working with key stakeholders um, and taking this comprehensive approach. And this includes both technical aspects about the persistent identifier, the metadata registration and the services and resolution. Those are key pieces. And there's some key things that we've done as the DOI foundation, as Peter alluded to um, in, in um, driving that forwards um, and providing really robust key technical infrastructure. But then there's also the discovery of these things. There's the technical staffing and infrastructure behind um, the community. There's the schema considerations at Datasite. We've had a, a metadata working group that is a community group and has been so since our founding in 2009, um, ensuring that the community governs at Datasite, um, our overarching governance is the General Assembly, which are our members, who are the ultimate decision-making body at Datasite. So putting those things in place, ensuring there's proper fiscal responsibility around scaling these, and then thinking about community engagement and advocacy and work with the community. And we've done this in many different contexts, and I can't list them all here, but recently a lot of work that we've been doing with IGSN, where IGSN um, is working and partnering with Datasite and scaling the community, things like working with DMP tool on DMP IDs, working with archive using our services to register DOIs for, for archive records. And so working together. Our collective efforts um, really uh, seek to create value in, I guess, three core areas. And in the interest of time, I won't go into too much detail, but fundamentally it's around registering of data site DOIs in our context, uh, but persistent identifiers more generally and the metadata to improve this discoverability and reuse. And that also has a number of different services and technology that needs to come with that. So things like the key registration services, but things like content negotiation, a DOI is a really useful piece of technology. If you have a DOI name, it's really easy to, um, for any system, ORCID as an example, you can simply add a DOI name and it doesn't need to know where that DOI lives. It's really easy to get the, the key metadata out of that through content negotiation, checking that persistent identifiers are resolving, link checking, uh, public APIs, interoperable schema, working with different standards and other community stakeholders. Um, working together to adopt and implement best practice. So thinking about things like the documentation, uh, bringing together passionate people, uh, evolving the metadata schema. And then finally, also looking to track the influence of research with tools and services. So building in things like dashboards, analytics, harvesting APIs um, and different services, graph APIs and relational metadata also comes into this. We've done a lot of work in uh, building a code graph and connecting different resources together. Um, and this is just a snapshot of uh, what we had in August and doing a bit more work. This is an open API, GraphQL API that we've made available to the community um, and also um, available in Datasite Commons, which is our user interface on top of the GraphQL API that brings together a number of different resources and then allows for the community to traverse and reuse metadata. But also behind this, we're doing things like tracking things like citations. So we can look at this. This is a view of a raw identifier for the NIH. We can track the aggregate citations, the views that have come through from the different repositories that feed that into open infrastructure, the downloads, um, and pulling this all together. 
it's all about community. And when we talk about working together, it's really important that we have fundamental values. And so uh, we talk about ourselves being mission led, but value driven. Um, we are um, really strong because of our active membership globally, uh, but focus on four key areas of values, reliability, um, so being reliable, sustainable infrastructure for the community, being very transparent in how we make decisions and, and what governance groups make decisions, how we build trust as, as, as a partner with our members and for our members with different community stakeholders and inclusivity. Um, together, working to enable really what we call the, the discovery cycle. And so uh, we go through uh, registering these persistent identifiers and metadata, connecting these together, making sure that it's discoverable, making sure that it's easy to track and continuing to work in the cycle. It does take a village, and this is really important, um, that, you know, as part of our mission, it is important for us to participate and lead in various activities. Um, and this is definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, there's things like the FDO forum that I haven't included the logo here, yeah, there's limited space. I'm um, sorry, Peter, but I, I'm giving some, some <laughs> uh, special mention to the FDO forum. So engaging with them, working with partners at EPEC as an example, uh, working within the different EOS projects, but as well as the different uh, interest groups, uh, working on things like make data count, uh, raw, we run the technical infrastructure for raw and actually develop the technology behind that. Uh, interesting projects like fair workflows, re3 data, um, raid, Natasha, you here. And, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do is, is really about us working together as a community. We're very cognizant that it's, we, a component or a, a cog in the ecosystem and you know we can't stand alone and so it's really important that we work together um and find ways to not build silos and and uh competing efforts really work in, in synergy with each other and so we always say join the conversation we're stronger together um there's different ways to be involved in our community and different governance groups and um, really interested to hear from the community and continue to work together. So with that, I will end. Um, you're welcome to reach out. And um, obviously, we're going to have a bit of time for discussion. So I look forward to hearing some of your questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks for that excellent presentation. I think we have we can take one question from the audience uh, before we go on break and come back to uh, Natasha's presentation. So, does anybody want to voice something, uh, ask a question to any of our speakers so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, <laughs> our moderators, do one of you want to pitch with a question? <laughs> Seems to be all clear. <laughs> I'm trying to find one that doesn't take a really long answer. <laughs> yeah. We do have Can a I... raised hand now, so. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Janet from uh, Gazes, and I would like to address my question to Peter. Um, how do you think, um, I mean, do you think it's important that we assign PIDs at a lower granularity level, for instance, variables within data sets? Because the common practice, of course, is just assigning PIDs for uh, studies or the role of data set, but um, do you think there is an advantage of having those PIDs for variables or files within the data set and so on? Well, first, uh, thanks, uh, Janet, for this question. First, I think we need to be careful with terminology. So uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we have all these differences. So I try to, to give an answer uh, since uh, at least Maggie and probably Matt as well, we thought a lot about the uh, issues which touch your question. So it's it's 
partly about the granularity is partly about the about the chance to uh, get re reused reuse of data and interest from other as Maggie said referenceability and things like this so I think the community communities have to make statements about useful granularities mm -hmm. so we discuss in our community we discuss a lot uh, when we cap, for example make brain images do we need to have a one recording of the brain you know which has different slices do we need to have PIDs for all these slices or just for the recording? Well, it's a matter of, uh, of uh, usability, is that correct? Right, so, so what is the kind of usage? Now, there are different, uh, different uh, uh, of course, answers. So if you, you come from the medical area, let's me stick to the brain, uh, uh, brain images. So it may be the case that you create a, you write a document where you point to specific uh, elements or, or how do you say uh, uh, specific things pixels in two slices of one brain image so i hope that you the brain the whole brain image the recording has a pid right and is referenceable but now for practical usage it could be that you say well you know these two slices are so important since there's a certain effect that i want to create uh, extract them and you can do this with software and give it a, themselves a pid Right. So it, you see, it's a matter of the granularity is a matter of usage. But, you know, if you choose for a certain granularity, like giving a PID to a recording at a specific time, at a specific moment, in a specific context, then there's no, uh, if you have the right tools, there's no reason or there's no, no one who can pre prevent you to create another PID from a subset. The other way around would be, you know, and that's what we discuss at the FDO forum, for example, an FDO a collection of FDOs is an FDO, right? So you could say, well, here's a, uh, here's a set of uh, data elements, which are, have some relation, and that's, you call it a, co a collection. You give it some metadata, you know, maybe AeroCrate, which uh, specifies the metadata of collections. You give it some metadata, you give it a PID, and then you have a bundle of resources, which closely work together. So in my institute, when we created this, um, this uh, um, uh, archive of the languages of the world, we had all these cases. So we had recordings of two hours of some ceremony. And, you know, people don't want to listen to two hours be when, before they see a certain event, which is relevant for linguistic or ethnological purposes. So they created, they had the tools, they created a snapshot of maybe two seconds and said, look here, and then they refer in their publication to just to not the whole issue, but to the two seconds. Is that an answer you are satisfied with? <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. I think we are perfect time now for a five minutes break and we'll come back at the top of the hour. So five minutes break, we'll come back to Natasha's presentation and the Q&A session. Thank okay. You. Thank you so far.
Hi, and welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Oh, good. OK. So thank you for all of those who uh, stayed with us so far. And we have our last speaker for the day. I'm going to reintroduce Natasha. Natasha Simmons is Associate Director for Data and Services for the Australian Research Data Commons. ARDC. She works nationally and internationally to solve key challenges to improve research data infrastructures, policies, skills, and practices. And Natasha is based in Queensland and Brisbane and leads a geographically distributed team who are passionate about enabling fair data and driving a corresponding change in scholarly communication culture. Thank you so much for joining us, Natasha, and we're super happy to have you. Thanks for being our speaker slash moderator. <laughs> and <laughs> take it away. Thank you very much, Sarah. And hello, everybody. Uh, so I thought, um, given this was an Ask Me Anything slot, that I would take a bit of creative license and talk about a potted history of Australian PIDs uh, that are told through the eyes of a PIDs nerd. That is the experience that I have lived and breathed of PIDs in Australia for the last 12 years or so. And I hope you find it informative and hopefully a little bit entertaining as well. Uh, so I wanna first start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands I meet and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. So um, this is especially important today, uh, which is Australia Day. And I'm uh, currently out of Brisbane, a bit further north on the Sunshine Coast, which is home of the Kabi Kabi and Jinnibara peoples. So on to the first start of my PID journey um, and probably the first steps that were made nationally uh, around persistent identifiers in Australia. Um, so if we casting my mind back to 2010, I was working then at the National Library, uh, which is in Canberra. It has a nice coffee shop and some stained glass and a nice view of the lake if you, if you ever be, uh, visit there. And I was working on a discovery service, a portal called Trove, which you may have heard about. And part of the Trove portal, there is a section called People and Organisations. And I was working on a project then that was funded by the Australian National Data Service to develop a, an identifier for that could co consistently identify people um, and organizations. The organizations part was quite a bit harder and I'm very pleased to say, to see RAW come along later. So these were in the pre-ORCID days and we basically built that identifier at a national level at the National Library um, to help connect researchers with their works, which was a current, uh, which was a problem. How do we do that? How do we distinguish one researcher from another? And how do we attribute the right researcher to the right works? And how do we, um, you know, make that discoverable as well? So I was part of that project. Um, and there was somebody very important on my board of directors there that I didn't know at the time. And his name's Adrian Burton. And he's currently, he was then a director at ANS and he's now my director at the Australian Research Data Commons. So we built that service and then along came ORCID a bit further down the track. Um, so let's just go a little bit further forward in time. So I made a big leap and moved all the way from Canberra to Brisbane. So this is a journey, a driving journey of about 14 or 15 hours, if anyone ever wants to attempt it, to give you an idea of how big Australia is. Um, and I was working at Griffith University in the e-research services unit as a senior research project manager. And um, I was working on projects that were funded jointly by the university and by the Australian National Data Service. And one of those projects involved a data site because ANS had just become a founding member of DataSite back in about 2011. 
And in this period, about 2013 was when ANS launched a service to enable the Australian research sector to mint digital object identifiers for research data collections. And one of my projects was building a data repository at the university, and I could see the value in assigning DOIs to data sets uh, to be able to persistently link to them, to help with citations, to help with the linking and discovery of resources, not just the data, but as we know, no data is better, best discovered when it's in context, when you see its relationship to the people who have been involved in creating it, to the organisations that have been involved in getting it together and all those kinds of things. So I was pleased to be able to mint the first DOI using the AND service across the whole of Australia. And I then had quite a lot of uh, questions about that service. I thought it raised a lot of issues around persistence and things like that. Uh, and I wrote an article about it and I blogged about it and people came and talked to me and I ended up getting quite a little community of DOIers together, DOI nerds together to uh, talk about this and implement it at other Australian research institutions. And that service now in ANS has uh, well beyond the members of the uh, universities in Australia. Uh, there's about 42 universities in Australia. That service has now got about 60, 70 uh, institutional users. So fast forward a little bit more, um, and I found myself working for ANS, um, and uh, this is in Canberra where visiting, so still living in Brisbane, but visiting here. And uh, I was an organizer of an event with Adrian and others at ANS to get together the heads of research office, the heads of libraries, our major research funders, and uh, Laurie Hack, who was then executive director of ORCID, to talk about um, the challenge we had of identifying researchers and linking them with their work. So the National Library uh, solution was not a great one for us. It wasn't uh, researcher sign up. It was it involved uh, having librarians do the matching for the for the automatic matching that failed, um, and nobody basically wanted to do that. That model wasn't a great one, uh, and research and and it wasn't international, which is I think the other lesson here. So anyway, at the time in ANS, we thought you know let's uh, see what happens. Let's try and get let's pay for Laurie to come out. Let's have this forum and discuss. Orchid and whether it can help us come up with that solution. And at that, uh, at that meeting, everybody in the room agreed that we had the same problem in um, linking researchers in their works. Um, and we all agreed that Orchid was a good solution. And everyone in the room said to our research funders, can you now mandate Orchid uh, in your uh, grant management systems? And they said, no, because we don't mandate things and um, you wouldn't be ready if we did. So we then set about for the next two years, um, getting building uh, an agreed upon model for the Australian Orchid Consortium and getting sign up for that. And this photo at the top is when we launched that consortium consortium. Um, so the, the other primary member there was CALL, the Council of Australian University Librarians, but we actually had all the major stakeholders in the room contributing to this, uh, including the research funders. And we launched the consortium with 40 members out of our, you know, 42 universities. It was an extremely successful launch and that um, is still going with the Australian Access Federation as the lead. So moving forward again a few years to maybe 2018 or so. Um, so or, or this is actually true today of me too. So I now run the identifier services for the ARDC um, under Adrian's leadership there. And I have, uh, we have the DOI service, a handle service, an IGSN service and a RAID service as well. So Matt um, mentioned RAID before the research activity identifier, which has just become an ISO standard. And we're working with the international community uh, to uh, better develop that so that it can be used as an identifier for research projects. And I'm also involved in a huge range of international forums that discuss PIDs, some of which we have talked about um, through the Research Data Alliance, the PID Interest Group, and the National PID Strategies Working Group that I'll talk about in a minute. Also, the SCOLEX initiative, I think I was involved in that for a while, is quite important at being able to link uh, data with publications. 
Okay, so moving on to just last year, only a few months ago, actually. Uh, so in my role at ARDC, I worked with More Brains Cooperative, his uh, Josh Brown and Phil Jones, to uh, where they did an investigation into the use of persistent identifiers in Australia. And their findings were that strategic investment in identifiers could save $24 million and 38,000 person days per year. And this report, um, it's backed up by the data. You can read it. It is available on Zenodo if you want to download it. And it has had a significant impact here. Now, one of the, one of the case studies in this um, piece of work that they did is from the Australian Research Council, one of our major funders. And they, uh, there is an estimate there from Professor Joe Schachter that he saves about three days per grant application because of the ARC's ORCID integration. Three days per grant application, which is a massive saving. And the ARC talk, a case study talks about the benefits of ORCID in terms of how it's improved um, their, you know, the integrity and trust in their systems and the uh, data reliability and all kinds of things. So have a read of that. But to me, that was something where, you know, we held up a vision in 2015. This is where we want to go. And this report has showed us that, you know, seven years later, we have gotten there with ORCID and I think uh, what we want to do now is move on to a national strategy for persistent identifiers. So this is my last uh, slide. So I'll just uh, sort of the, the segue into the national PID strategy, strategy is that piece of work that Josh and Phil did giving us the evidence base for how what sort of identifiers we might want to invest in and how if we agree on it nationally, and we agree on those common identifiers and have a strategy in place that we could reach that uh, savings figure, increase accuracy of reporting, just increase the overall, overall discoverability of research as part of this, the fairness of it. Um, so Australia, uh, the Australian PID strategy is launching this, we're having discussions, you know, we sort of have six months basically of talking about the strategy, sharing the documents with the community, getting feedback. We have a workshop coming up, we set up a, a task force of some fairly senior persons, and we hope that by mid-year we will basically have a roadmap that we can use to help um, to be able to implement the strategy, but we'll see, that may be ambitious. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, Australia is not the only country to be developing a national PID strategy. There are many, many countries. As a co-chair of the Research Data Alliance National PID Strategies Working Group, we have collected nine case studies so far, and we are developing a how-to guide for PID strategies. Um, the difficulty is that they're all works in progress and it is hard. We will be capturing things at a point of in time. So I might leave it there. Um, thanks very much for listening and I hope you got something out of the presentation. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that excellent presentation. And uh, our speakers, if you could please join us again. And as I will hand over to our moderators, uh, Nabil, Patricia, and uh, so Julia, Natasha, please feel free to take some of the questions maybe from the um, audience as well as your own questions. So I'm going to hand it over to you and take it away. Uh, I guess I will um, ask a question from the um, ones that were put in the notes document. And I guess I'll start with uh, one for Maggie, which is what is a non-data object and how do you know? Um, we hear code is data, workflows is data, et cetera. Um, does that matter for identifiers? Oh, that's a great question. Um so with non-data objects, I, I mean the stuff that I was referring to briefly in, in my presentation. So uh, things that are maybe uh, like uh, samples, uh, physical samples, uh, um, uh, software in different forms, uh, all uh, instrumentation, even measurement stations or, or platforms that you use for making measurements. Uh, <clears throat> 
And uh, I should say a special case of software is modeling code, uh, which I think it's it, um, the, much of the modeling community that is associated with the uh, Envris that I work with uh, are, are a little bit uh, waking up to, to this reality <laughs> that maybe we should be a little bit more clear and, and machine actionable when we are describing not only the, which exact uh, software version that we used uh, to calculate this and that, but also make sure that, that they're... Um, uh, their their uh, workflows and processing uh, also produces a lot of provenance so that it's absolutely clear that this model output data set X, it was produced with input data A, B and C, which are then clearly pitted and, and also attributable and citable in, in whatever things and, and uh, uh, yeah, all of these things. So, so that's what I meant with the non-data. Uh, objects to, to really make sure that anything that is used in the in the data life cycle or the research life cycle uh, is identified if it uh, needs to be uh, unambiguously identified. And I should say that these physical things, uh, of course, should have a digital representation first so that you can put it into a catalog. Uh, of some kind and, and collect all the metadata that are related to, to this uh, entity. Uh, what was the second part? I, sorry, I sort of forgot that. Um, it was uh, about, um, you know, there's a lot of phrases like code is data and workflows is data. Um, it says, does it matter for identifiers? Well, the, the question, I guess, is what does it does this does it matter mean? Uh, I, right. I think if you start off by, by saying yes, it should be identified in some way, then then I would take it a bit further and say what kind of identifier system yeah. is appropriate for this. And, and uh, Peter was uh, talking about the, the handle-based uh, identifiers, which are of course also what what the, the data site. Um, identifiers the DOIs are, are based on, on this handle uh, principle or type of identifier. There, there are other types of identifiers. Uh, Peter warned a little bit against using uh, uh, URLs or persistent URLs, which may contain semantics and things like that in it. But I, th I think we, we, we are, they are there to stay and, and uh, not the least in, also URLs in the form that is used in linked data. Uh, approaches. Uh, I mean, they, they are very useful, very versatile. Um, there, the key is that one should, if you have an object or if it's a code or, or whatever, and you are looking for someone to give help you to uh, register a, a PID for that, uh, then you you should take a look at the the service that, that you are interested in using and, and seeing uh, really, is it sustainable? Is it uh, having funding? Is it uh, uh, a really national initiative or a very regional one? Or does it have global uh, recognition and all of these things? And, and uh, if your neighbor sets up a, a basement run a PID service, maybe that's not the first one you should be going to if you are considering um, something that you need to be alive and working and resolvable and all of these things and maintainable in, in a, well, 5, 10, 50, 100 year perspective. Thank you. Um, either of my moderators want to ask a question or pick one? I think Peter has his hand raised. If I may. Just a short uh, uh, add-on to what Mickey said. So I, Mickey mentioned the major points here, but let me uh, also tell you that I'm just reading a, a lot of stuff from uh, European initiatives in the industry world. And what we see, of course, not only in the scientific world, but also in the industry world, that the amount of services, I shouldn't say tools, but services on the web, right? that they, or internet, that they are increasing. And of course you have also the version numbering and so forth. So in the, in the, in the, uh, in the realm of the fair digital objects, we are discussing now that a fair digital object has a type. And when you have a type, 
then you should be able to relate it to uh, to uh, uh, services software. Well, we need to make sure that this relation is also stable and clearly pointed, right? Otherwise, we'll get a huge mess. So here is my clear answer. Well, we will have to go to PIDs, whatever PIDs, for services as well, software, right? There is no way out. Otherwise, we will get a mess with all our references, uh, which we are creating. Yes, and I was a bit hesitant with the URLs. We will have them also in future, but they are a bit of dangerous, as we all know from the fear of four lessons we learned. Matt, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th I thought I'd, um, I, I know we're looking for questions. I thought I'd jump in and answer a question. There was one around DOIs and somebody echoed that. So I thought I'd jump into that if that's okay. Cool. Yeah, so there's a, a comment around what is the economic burden of uh, registering PIDs. And uh, I think somebody said um, it's a dollar per DOI. So I can't speak for other infrastructures. Um, but I can say that from data sites perspective, we uh, use a um, tiering model. So as an example, if you register 2 million uh, DOIs in a year, that would be 13,500 euros. And this is all on the web page approved by our members. Um, I think what's really important to consider here is that running persistent identifier infrastructure and services costs money. Um, that's a fact. And so everyone around the table can agree on that. It's what is a sustainability model? And I think that's a really important consideration to make sure that that's clear and transparent because we don't want to be investing time and effort, the economic burden of investing in something that has soft funding and that falling away in two years is even more so. So it's really important we have robust models that scale and sustain the infrastructure. Um, we also are very um committed to doing things like raw there is no fee for raw the model for raw is that there's a commitment across this cdl data site and crossref boards to sustain raw as a community infrastructure resource um that we can all leverage and benefit from so i i think you know, from an economic burden, I, I don't want to shy away from there is a cost. And that's something that, um, you know, we, we definitely don't want to hide away from. But it's also important to, alongside that conversation, understand what does that go towards and, and how is that used to benefit the community? Um, and as you register more uh, persistent identifiers, it demands more of the infrastructure. And that's what we've modeled our model on is purely a cost recovery basis is more DOIs mean more demand on the infrastructure, more demand on the APIs, um, more cost. But we also, if you register 2 million DOIs this year, there'll be a fee. But if you register zero the next year, there's no fee towards that. So you only pay when you're registering those DOIs. It's, it's effectively a once-off fee um, that we would then build into our model and continue to sustain the services. So um, yeah, I, I hope that kind of addresses it. Um, and then, you know, Natasha touched on the, the cost benefit in sort of weighing that up and, and how you look at what is the cost associated with it and what is the benefit. And that sometimes I know from Natasha's point of view, looking at that, there's a tangible actual saving that they're looking at and, and evaluating the cost of the economic burden cost of paying for persistent identify uh, infrastructure to the saving is you know really beneficial and so yeah i'm happy to also follow up if there's follow-up questions on that thank you very much so we have a lot of questions to go through peter do you have one final comment on this and then we can move on to the other questions or are you answering a new question no just to emphasize what uh, what uh, matt says so when i speak about trap then this means cost. So just to 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 uh, emphasize what Matt said, and there are of course different models, and I think we need to. And I hope Natasha, your solution will uh, go in this direction. Who has now to pay the cost for registering a DOI or whatever PID? Right? Is it the individual researcher? Uh, I can tell you that the Max Planck Society years ago decided that they uh, pay the service for every researcher in the Max Planck Society. A similar solution has been taken by the Slovenian 
uh, people, the, the Slovenian center pays the registration of uh, handles and uh, and it's similar like the model the cost model for for internet no one of us researcher pays pays the traffic on internet it's done by the government or by other institutions and i think we all should uh, push our institution that this is done in the same way for pids thank you very much so uh, patricia i think you have a question so <laughs> hand it over yeah uh, there, there's an i think like a good question to follow on from that that is uh in the hack md i don't know who who wrote it but i like it very much and i think it's following on exactly um from the the points that you that peter just made he he, he you actually made the point that institutions take on these costs um but that also means um we we hide uh, the real costs of the infrastructure from the researchers using it um, so uh, the question that is uh, in the HackMD is how do we get funders to fund um, boring these boring infrastructure projects? We've we've heard a lot about what's involved in keeping it running and it all costs money. Um, so what have like what are people's um, ideas around funding things uh, long term and uh, um, yeah, keeping things up, but um, also there there is something like uh, the, the question says like funding shiny new stuff um, is more attractive. But I think it's uh, also in the in the pit stuff is like how do you maybe get a new identifier off the ground? Um, um, as as another question, how basically get to do you get the buy in to uh, make that sustainable from the get go? Um, Matt uh, volunteered uh, to give that a first go, so please go ahead. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of comments, and I I just wanted to echo also. This is so great to hear this because it's often what's shiny and exciting that gets funded, and so. Um, one example, we were just funded to build an open data citation corpus by Welcome. And for us, that was really pleasing that a funder came to us and said, this is the underlying infrastructure piece that we want to fund. It's boring, it's data, it's a corpus, but it's not the shiny dashboards necessarily. And so I don't know if I have a specific answer um, but rather that I think we as a community in the persistent identifier infrastructure community need to demonstrate how we're working together um, to continue to work with funders like that. We do have challenges like the European Commission is putting funding into this space, but it's a competitive landscape. And so groups come together and then, you know, inevitably one group will be left out. And that's unfortunate for the community. Um, so it, it's you know, I think something that we, it, it's on us as, as a community to demonstrate how we can work together and how we can sustain that. And um, again, I think we need to, funders are very hesitant. So one of the conversations that we often have with funders is, well, what happens when the funding ends? Are you going to come back to us for funding? So how do you sustain that? And so we've been very diligent in showing them how we've transferred things into models that are sustainable and those sort of things. And that's something that we can do as a community. I think with a lot of the policy shifts, there has been, I guess, an interest and there's an opportunity for infrastructure to go like the Nelson memo in the US to go and talk to funders about this is critical, this is important, this is a group, you know, an ecosystem, can you support us in driving this forwards? Um, so I don't have, I, I guess, a specific answer, but just raising it's a really important point and and um i'm sure i yeah interested here i'm sure maggie and peter and natasha have some some other thoughts as well thank you uh yeah maggie your your thoughts please yeah i would let grace go ahead first yeah i'm breaking my silence so sorry um my daughter is uh is is up so i might get distracted here but um i i'm at a funder now um and it's a. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I would say, um, you know, from from looking at this perspective, um, the landscape is very um, difficult, you know, for a funder to discern, right? So um, there's a lot going on and having sort of a map of like what, because, um, you know, in some ways we want to be sort of dis decisive and we want to 
um, you know, use services that others are, you know, using widely. And, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, the other thing is that, um, and this is not just funders, but, um, you know, some of these other organizations, like I was also at a society, is that there's this enterprise mindset, um, you know, that uh, we are very much in the community and, you know, working with researchers and, you uh, um, but like when you get to that, to that point, there's like this enterprise mindset of like, well, we, you know, we purchase this turnkey solution and we, you know, we do this, uh, and, and, and I think that that's one of the other sort of difficult things of mapping out the landscape and, uh, you know, like the, just, uh, trying to determine what, uh, what you sort of particularly fund. Um, but I will say this, um, that there, the, yes, yeah, there's, there is hope. <laughs> so um, in the open research funders group um, and, and in other funders groups I'm in that um, just like what Matt said, um, the, the national uh, approaches that are, are you know, coming online, like the year of open science um, and, uh, you know, the work that's sort of being uh, driven by the White House and NASA, but also UNESCO and, and uh, some of these other national approaches um, that Natasha mentioned. Um, that's, you know, having us look at um, how we sort of together, we, we approach, um, um, you know, open science, um, how, how we sort of uh, look at infrastructure together. And uh, so I think I think that that's just starting to really ramp up now, um, and uh, it's it's good to see. Um, but you know, we we don't make it easy, you know, for for funders and for other because we're you know we're not sort of consolidating this information in an easy easy um, you know way to process. Um, so, thanks for that insight Chris it's always helpful to have someone from the funder side explain how the community looks to them and um yeah where where we could do better to uh, pitch to to a funder Maggie do you want to follow up now yes uh, so I just have these thoughts that uh, maybe more from a end user or a consumer of PID services that um obviously, we do not just need the status quo or what we have now um, in terms of the functionalities and, and the tooling and all of these things that go around using and, and allowing us to really leverage the, the persistent identifiers. We, we also have to have uh, development uh, both on a technological scale because of course uh, IT uh, is moving ahead at a, a, a fantastic speed and we need to adapt the existing um, back end of, of uh, the, the PID services that we already have so that they are uh, up to speed, have high capacity, can deal with uh, moving from millions of objects to billions and billions of objects that need to be identified. And, and of course, also not just the registration itself, but we need to be able to resolve these um, PIDs that we have so that we can get back the pointer to, to the objects and or the metadata and maybe also perform advanced searches at PID registry level uh, if we move into this fair digital object uh, paradigm where, where we would also have uh, an extended set of, of uh, metadata that is required already at PID registry level that then uh, Th that will open up huge possibilities, at least for very data intensive research, uh, but uh, it, it will cost even more. And, and uh, in the European Open Science Cloud context, I mean, we, we had around a couple of years ago where we tried to assess the, the existing PID service landscape and looked at the sort of suggestions for improvements. Uh, also in functionality and in capacity, and we made a, a kind of priority list of that. And now that the EOSC has uh, started off in earnest, um, we, we have a, a new task force that is uh, looking back at this and, and trying to come up with even further recommendations. And there are several uh, projects associated now with the European Open Science Cloud um, construction that, that are going to create these new uh, services and functionalities and, and tools, etc. But again, um, 
the, the, the sustainability of keeping up access to these new services and tools. So that, that is also something that we need to, to have a really open debate about. And how do we and what we do in Europe, uh, how can we ensure a compatibility with things that are being developed on other continents? Uh, I, I think uh, the world of computing and, and uh, TCP IP, et cetera, has shown that, that a development that has sort of kicked off and turned out to be very successful, regardless of where in the world that was developed, um, I guess in the US mainly, I mean, it became a universal standard. So, so we need to, to make sure that what is worth to keep and, and use throughout the, in a global perspective is actually done regardless of who is behind it or whatever. So, um, and, and I'm not sure that all rec governments and, and funders of all of this really recognize the importance of having things that actually work globally for everyone. Not until they break at least, yes. <laughs> and Natasha, anything to add from your national um, policy perspective. Yes. Yes, thank you, Patricia. I think, um, so I can only speak obviously from my experience in Australia, but I think there is money out there in the sector. There are money, there is money that is put towards research infrastructure. And um, I think one of the successes that we had with the Australian Orchid Consortium, I think the approach there is that we started with the problem. You know, people invest in things where they see the value for the investment. And if you start with the common problem rather than the solution, and you actually give a little space for the problem to be aired and people say, yes, we have that problem. For example, one of our problems at the moment that we haven't quite solved is you know, people want to be able to identify their research instruments and see how they're being used in the research that's produced so that the, uh, the, the infrastructure providers can say, see, we did that, we built that thingamatron and now it was used to produce this awesome piece of research. Um, and that is a problem that can be solved in part through PIDs. Uh, but we start with that problem and then we look at how can PIDs help solve that problem and how can it be done on like an international scale because that's the way that we have to think about things. I agree with Maggie's comment there. So I think as well, my experience is that, you know, people who build PID systems, and this is no not offending anyone here because I'm part of that as well, you know, we're very good at building the things, the good things and building them really well, but we're not always so good at selling them and um, doing the sell part of it. And there are people who are really good at the sell, you know, especially the sell back to government or the sell back to funders of the thing that's been built. And I think we really need some strategies in place to be able to do that. But for community adoption, I think it's all about getting the right people in the room and looking from the problem perspective and then how can PIDs help in the solution. Thank you. And Peter is the last one. Just, and then I, I think just everyone may add can... a short comment here. So Matt gave a very excellent uh, perspective about the stack of services which you can build upon PIDs, let me say, right? And I think we need to learn that the, this we need to differentiate between different uh, service type of services. And if we just have, for example, a lean PID service, the Max Planck Society has a small server and one person, not a full-time person, dedicated for the whole society, just registering PID, resolving PIDs. So if we learn how to, how to uh, uh, give pricing for different types of services, then it would be possible, maybe, Patricia, to convince our, our providers. But I agree with Natasha, of course. You have to uh, see the whole picture. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you, everyone. Nabil, next question. Yeah, so I, I hope that I answered the question um, correctly. But this is a question for Peter. And uh, it's saying, are Donna bits portable? Can one move providers, MPAs, or uh, resolvers? So I think it's more of um, or more about the interoperability between registration agencies. If I, if I understood well, yeah. yeah. So so Nabil, thanks for the question, and uh, Matt knows this as well. 
so so at the root resolver, we only share prefixes and they are redundant, right? So to make sure that if one service breaks, the whole machinery does not break, right? But at the level of uh, of uh, uh, the individual, of the, let me call them the local service providers, a strange term. So DOI foundation is a service provider here or the data site. At that level, uh, donor doesn't care anymore. So it's the responsibility of the different people, service provider, how they manage their job. And of course, they again have to uh, take care of redundancy. Otherwise, you know, you would not rely on their service. Well, the, the, with respect to the PID records, uh, I think, um, so, so Matt has a, 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 a data site has a specific business model and describing, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, what kind of attributes you should associate with the, with the DOI, right? Uh, and there, the other service providers do it in a different way. I think what we need to do now is, and that's what FDO is looking for, is to register the different attribute attributes as types in an open registry where the registry just doesn't matter. So we can use DOI's registry and, or data site, but registry them in a, uh, in, a, in a proper way so that we can achieve interoperability. And that means, you know, I could then take, if Matt allows me, take all the data site uh, <laughs> PIDs, DOI's, right? Put it on the Max Planck server and you go, right? So it's the definitions of the attributes is there and you could uh, use them. That's my answer, Nabil. So yes, my answer is yes. This is different. If you if you now do go to DITS, you probably all know DITS. That's a new World Wide Web standard, distributed identifiers. Well, it's there are already 160 schemas or so, <laughs> and daily per day there are more. So who who is responsible for this? Uh, the Pandora box is opened. Let me say. So who's responsible for all these schemas? No one. So everyone can create what he or she wants. It's a nice, it's a nice uh, idea, of course. But interoperability is is a is a nightmare. Then you see the the differences, right? Yeah. And this is this is why governance is also important, Peter. You know, like within the donor structure, we we often do this. You know, IDSN as an example, set outside yeah. of the DOI infrastructure, and there's ways to do. Um, aliasing across identifiers, we regularly, you know, members switch between data site and crossref based on their cases and services, and there's mechanisms to do this. But what Peter raises is a really good point is that we can do more because what happens is we can switch at the handle level um, where to point to. But the metadata elements have to be re-registered. So if somebody moves from, say, That's data right. site to crossref, they have to re-register it on crossref side. Um, and so we could make that even more streamlined for them. Um, and yeah, Peter, you can take the data at CC0. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Matt, that, that is then dependent on the metadata scheme where yeah. uh, we have a difference between data site, for example, and other providers, right? Yeah. So, exactly. which is which is simple. Yeah. This is where FDOs also yeah. help. So, yeah. this. Nabil, I hope it's clear or not. Perfect. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you so much, P uh, Matt. I, I might have, you know, follow-up question, which is more in uh, into the collaboration between the registration agencies, because I, I saw Matt um, mentioned Crossref in, in in one of his slides. So, is it the same um, collaboration way with the other registration agencies, like I don't know, Medra or uh, yeah, IDR or I don't know the Korean or the, or the Chinese ones, just just to understand the ecosystem? Um, yeah, I guess we all have different relationships with each other. We all work, I guess, symbi symbiotically in many ways. Actually, some many registrations are members of data site, as an example. Um, we collaborate and build things together. Um, we all sit on the DOI Foundation board. But then there's also a collaboration with, I, I talk regularly with people like Peter, people like... Um, uh, Tibor uh, from EPEC, you know, there, there's a lot of collaboration outside of just the DOI Foundation broadly. We talk a lot with ORCID, we talk a lot with um, RAID, um, you know, the RAW is one where we're involved in. So, um, yeah, there's collaboration, but I don't think there's a very good sort of, uh, there's no clear cut or, or uh, um, I guess, um, standard way of collaborating, but we all talk to each other. 
Um, I think we could do a better job. Um, we sometimes <laughs> do do things in parallel or don't don't so uh, we we catch up and then we go, oh wait, we're doing something similar. And then we've kind of invested in, you know, we're both trying to do the same thing. We could do be a bit more streamlined. Um, not always easy because this landscape is so broad and there's so many different things happening. Um, and let's be honest, Matt, due to the tits, which are now very uh, fashion, we will get a more complex landscape. Yeah, it's, exactly. a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, yeah. I can tell you. No. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Matt. Maybe, you know, last third question, and this is from, from me. Um, I mean, personally, I, I'm looking to, to know if there is a special registration for indigenous, indigenous knowledge data. Sorry, I'm pronouncing the word badly and for uh, patents so just just to understand if i mean if it's of course registration of doi but um does that um go to a specific registration agency or is it uh i mean a common work that data site or crossref can can do I think when you think about the use of persistent identifiers, this is more broad, you know, for anything, I think you need to consider the services and what you're looking for um, in your workflows, um, not only the, the resource type. I would say any any um, organization can support um, registration of um, resources that have indigenous knowledge rights. And what is important is that we're labeling them. So I'll put in a link now, I was just looking for it, um, but the TK labels is a good good initiative. And we've um, done a bit of work there and a, a lot of this relates back to metadata schemas. So I'll put that in there and we still wanna do even more work um, on this. And I think other, other different uh, PID authorities, I'll call them, are also um, doing more work in this important area. Thank you. There are a few um, nice questions around policy that came up, which um, I and and strategies, which I would um, put to Natasha first. One is like a clarification um, on what you've kind of talked about. Uh, um, if you if you could just highlight what the objective is that uh, your national PIT um, strategy serves. But then there's also a um, like wider question around um, what, how you take um, all those national level policies and EOSC level policies and how you tr actually practically translate that into um, something in your institution and in your services. So um, if you have reflections on that, Natasha, and then everyone else can maybe um, pitch in afterwards. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the objective of our national PID strategy is to try and realize the benefits of our investment in persistent identifiers on a national scale. Uh, we take the findings from the more brains um, ben, uh, the cost benefit analysis that they did uh, where they have pointed to I mean it's sort of boiled down to that 24 million and 38,000 point per person days that's the headline but there's a lot of other of course arguments in there for why you should be using PIDs um, which we all know here. <laughs> so we've got the basis there for why we want to do this. And the strategy is a really about how we're going to do this because, you know, there's there's a lot of different PID systems out there. It's a bit of a confusing environment. Um, and what we would really like is agreement at on a national scale that if we as a, as a collective invest in these top, priority identifiers, then that will we will maximize the savings uh, around that dollar figure, around the person figure, and around just the whole other benefits around accuracy and in, in reporting, et cetera, faster. So that's that's really one of our main motivations is just to get on the same page nationally. It's basically taking the way that we did the Australian Orchid Consortium, starting with a problem, coming up with a solution and implementing it and then realising the benefits of that, same thing, but expanding it to other PIDs 
like the DOIs and how, but we, we, we need to have the discussion at a national level and we don't think, you know, it's not an approach to just say, you should all do this because no one's going to do that. I mean, even if you pay people to do that, they will just do it for the amount of time that you give them the funding to do that for. But if you get everyone at the table and they can see the value of it because you've had the discussion and you've agreed that, yes, we're going to do that. And then through that process, we can decide, you know, on things like we've talked about here, what is the business model for this? You know, the ARDC, for example, offers the data site DOIs free to the Australian research sector. Orchid consortium costs to join, you know, should ARDC pay for the orchid stuff or, you know, should we have a whole, because we're funded through the government, through the government's um, strategic investment in building research infrastructure, should we do that? So the conversation is yet to be had. And I believe, in my view, the conversation is the most important part of the whole national strategy. And then we get into the implementation plan, plan which would be a sort of three to five year thing. Um, as far as the policies go, I do believe, you know, yes, uh, so ARDC also has a PIDS policy, and of course I've read the EOSC PID policy as well, and it is a challenge of how, yes, how do you implement these at an institutional level, um, and I think from ARDC's point of view, all we can say is this is why they're important and that's why we're offering them to you. We have communities of practice uh, in Australia that ARDC facilitates so that we can have those discussions both on the sort of new and emerging PIDs like instruments and the really well-established PIDs, so we have a data site DOI community of practice, which we lead with data site and with actually uh, the National Library of New Zealand because they run the data site consortium there. And those communities of practice can really help with the implementation as well. Uh, so there's a sort of a few ideas there, but I will stop talking and uh, see who wants to go next. Thank you so much. Maggie put something really useful in the in the chat about um, actually recommendations on uh, working a group working on recommendations on how to take these policies forward. So it seems like uh, because these policies are still reasonably fresh, um, the community is is um, coming together and um, uh, providing solutions. But yeah, that's uh, uh, really helpful to to know that the discussion comes first and um, and the community comes together to to address this. Um, Nabil, do you have any questions that you would like to ask next? Oh, Juliana, sorry. Oh, uh, let's see, how much time do we have left? We have uh, three minutes. Three minutes. So maybe <laughs> yeah. should we wrap up? So <laughs> any of the moderators have any last questions? Otherwise, I'll start the wrap up. Or anything you'd like to highlight, comments or something? You have three, three minutes. I asked my question, which was the funding one. Okay. So Peter, Natasha, Matt, Maggie, our moderators, Patricia and Nabil, thank you so, so much. And also our team. So what we're going to do is that um, the the notes from today will be cleaned up and uh, along with the chat as well. So all the links that you posted in the chat, all the important and interesting discussions will be um, cleaned up and added to the hack and be we're gonna we're gonna publish make a document out of it. We're gonna distribute it afterwards to everybody who signed up. Uh, the recording will be on our YouTube channel, so that will also go up uh, and as well. Um, your information will be scraped so from, from the meeting notes, so don't worry about that. Um, and I, I just want to say that if anybody is interested in signing up for the rest of the series, we have, uh, please do that in, 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 in the link I just posted. If, uh, also, part of those uh, RDA series is um, just like it uh, is, is two podcasts. So every month, or not every month, but like we have five themes for each theme. We have one of those events. We have a fair data podcast and a theme centric podcast, and you can listen to uh, the ID themes uh, over here. Um, I'm 
really grateful for all the work that uh, came together, really thankful for the RDA and EOSC features and best leadership that allowed this work to happen. Um, for all of you, thank you so, so much. And uh, a, a big thank you for all, also for our audience for driving the discussion and for coming to us with, with the questions and, and for your uh, presence. So, and my team. <laughs> so, Thanks to Julian, you, Sarah and your colleagues for organizing all this. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, and uh, Chris, Donnie, Julian, thank you so, and the real thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll hang you around for another five minutes for folks uh, and I'll turn off.